Please welcome producer Tanya Sagachian and editor Peter Chiberis. Cody uh, Smith Fee will be joining us shortly. Um, he's in traffic, but he will be here. Um, welcome, Tanya and Peter. Um, I'm actually to start with a question that I'm dying to ask you, Tanya, and it's about the character of uh, Bronco uh, uh, Henry. Um, this movie f almost feels like a ghost story vis-a-vis -vis his character. Um, can you tell us about storytelling-wise, was that challenging in the decision of not showing him? Hello. There we go. Well, uh, hi, Roger, and thank you all for staying. Um, can I just say before I answer that question, uh, Jane Campion is really uh, disappointed not to be able to be with us here in Santa Barbara today. Uh, unfortunately, she tested positive and therefore was unable to travel, but she was so looking forward to being here. I just wanted to share that with you and acknowledge that um, she's really disappointed because she thinks this is an incredibly important festival and... So that's for, Thank you. for Jane. Thank you. Um, but with regards to Bronco Her Henry, um, Jane and I worked very closely on the adaptation and that was actually the big challenge that we started with. Um, how, do we, uh, how do we represent him if we're gonna represent him and if we're not gonna represent him, how do we do that? And we decided pretty quickly that we would like him to remain a figment of Phil's imagination. And that influenced our decision about who to cast as Phil, because we knew we needed to have an actor who was able to be the tough alpha presenting in the way that he does present, but also someone with vulnerability and sensitivity and the capacity to love, so that in that intimate moment when he's alone with his own fantasies and memories and reveries that we would be able to access the imagination of Bronco through him. Um, Peter, I don't recall a film where I was so aware of the music and the editing almost dancing with one another. Can you tell us about working with this core? Yeah, I mean, um, sorry, that's louder than I expected. <laughs> um, well, we got the score really early on, like in the first few weeks of the edit, when Jane got into the edit. So it was really a process of um, almost cutting the music like it was a character in the film. It wasn't about replacing cues that we'd found that worked. It was, it was finding a place for things and just really getting to know the score that had been delivered. I think we had something like 32, 33 tracks from the beginning and it was kind of without being told where they were supposed to go. So it was really about finding how it married the story and, and the tone was so imbued in it. And so the kind of film wrapped itself around the score in a sense. It was um, a really inter organic, interesting process in that sense. And, and Tanya, uh, you work with uh, Jane Campion in Bright Star. And for those in the audience who haven't seen Bright Star, get yourself a copy of it and watch it. Um, when, when did you guys tap into Thomas Savage's novel and decided that that was your next project? Yeah, Jane and I met um, on Bright Star, which was 15 years ago, and um, uh, we decided that we wanted to make another feature film together, but she segued into television and made the two Top of the Lake series in between. So we'd been looking for something. And then in 2017, she was given a book by her stepmother, and she shares lots of books with me because we both like to read. And she said, read this. And I wasn't sure whether she meant read it because it's a good book or read it because it's something we could do with one another. And I read it. I felt instinctively that it was perfect material for her and had all sorts of elements that 
were very relevant to today, but were a period story that Jane's own unique sensibility could master and access. And it began to haunt her. And once she decided she wanted it and we'd managed to secure the rights, it was pretty, um, pretty swift, the adaptation process and the transition into making the film. Um, you know, it took her about a year to adapt it. And um, the challenges of the making film really came from starting shooting pre-COVID and then having to stop in the middle <laughs> and not know whether or not we were ever going to be able to bring everyone back together again and complete the film. But did that pause, did that pause enrich the, the process or deter? Oh, enrich, absolutely. But I mean, Peter should speak to that because he put together um, a cut of what we'd done. Yeah, um, a lot of things came out of that three month break. In a sense, there was some handheld material from the first part of the shoot that really wasn't completely part of the plan for the for Phil's all Phil's um, kind of tactile, emotional uh, channeling of his energy into into objects like the saddle um, and him on the bed. Just these private moments. All all there was a kind of learning from the first part of the shoot that without the time to think about it and watch, which was a terrifying first cut because half of it was missing. <laughs> and there was just like black slugs for scenes. But there was a lot of learnings that kind of came from um, having watched the first half of the shoot um, and figuring out what, what was working and what, what could be brought into the second part of the shoot. I think maybe I should explain to the audience that we shot on both the South and North Islands in New Zealand, and we did all the exteriors first. So we'd completed all the shooting in the South, but we didn't have any of the interiors. So we were cutting together this strange half beast. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very strange to watch it all strung together because it was like essentially this film only exists outside. Um, and the house doesn't really exist. You alluded, Peter, to micro moments in the, in, in, in the film that you edited. Can you talk about those moments? One of the things that I'm, I'm so struck about the film and your editing is that you make invisible emotions visible and is through the usage of the, this micro moments. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's really hard to explain that kind of... Um, Editing, except that you just pour as much feeling into it yourself to kind of really um, try to try to just create a feeling. Um, and you know, you're reacting to Johnny's music, which has so much texture and feeling in it too, and Ari's beautiful camera work. And it's just a dance between all those elements and just trying to find, just strike a, a feeling, essentially. And, and if I could also add to that, I think one of the great skills of Jane as a writer as well as a, a director is that's what she's able to do. So some of the key set pieces in the film don't exist in the novel. They're passing moments which she's amplified to get in the sense of desire and yearning and an erotic sensibility, which is part of what she does so well. And atmosphere, like she's an absolute master of creating a feeling in the air and an atmosphere around um, the characters and the place. And yeah, I mean, it's, she's, she's pretty fantastic at it. <laughs> um, Tanya, I read that you met with the Savage uh, family and also Annie Prue, who wrote Brokeback Mountain. Uh, can you tell us about meeting them and the influence on the film? Yeah, when, when we started um, thinking about making the film, Jane said two things to me. One, that, you know, as a woman and someone who wasn't American, she wanted to make sure she had an authentic grasp on the material before she really committed to it. And second, that Annie Prue was one of her favourite novelists. So 
I thought to myself, I must contact Annie Prue and ask if we can meet and then fix a research trip in Montana for Jane to go and see the place where Savage grew up and was inspired. And luckily, Annie got back and said she loved Jane's work and would love to meet. And we found an academic in Montana who was specializing in Thomas Savage and who knew the family and introduced us to his nephew and um, you know, took us to the home that, and the ranch that Savage had grown up on. You build so much tension very slowly, uh, Peter. Can you tell us about that process? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, a lot of that's to do with um, holding things back and, and allowing um, the opportunity for the audience to kind of imagine where the story is going, which, you know, it's such a, a story that doesn't go where you think it's going to go. So, so much of it's in the anticipation of what's going to happen. Um, and a lot of it was about, like, just keeping Phil and Peter's character apart for long enough in the build-up to them finally coming together. We, we trimmed a few scenes out um, between those two uh, just to kind of hold off their, um, their... just to bring their orbit closer and closer rather than kind of bringing them together from the beginning, which is kind of what used to happen in the script uh, when he first arrived on the ranch. So. Yeah, there's also the combination of both sexual tension and like the physical threat of violence um, and danger. So it's kind of this beautiful combination that Jane created in the script between sexual and a violent tension, or like almost like a thriller. Um, yeah, so it's kind of. And what about the fact that it's a, such a shocking ending? But if you know, I've seen the film a few times and. It's all there, but it's, it's very subtle. You know, can you talk about inserting the hints? Yeah, I mean, I wish Cody was here for this bit because I think a lot of that has to do with how well he played that character and how, you know, you just don't suspect him the same way Phil doesn't suspect him and no one really thinks about him in this way, although he's doing everything in plain sight but it's just such a great character that you just don't suspect that he'll be that guy who's, everyone thinks he's the There weak. are moments like the, the dissecting of the, the rabbit that, you know, you, you, you don't make anything of it when you first watch it, but then you know, you, you know what happens at the end, then you watch it again and go, oh, it's, it yeah. was there all along. And, and the killing of the rabbit, you know, the putting the rabbit out of its misery in front of Phil, and he kind of takes note that this kid's, oh, there's something to this kid, but he still doesn't suspect that, you know, he's, he's um, capable of, of what he ends up doing. Um, yeah, so it was, you could really hide in plain sight because there was also, like, this kind of love story brewing, which was the focus of the story. So, like, all of Peter's little um, moments and clues are kind of hidden in the background as a subplot almost. Um, but I think what Phil and, what's going on between Phil and Peter emotionally is definitely taking most of your attention. But be before, I wanted to just jump in before he does arrive and share with you how extraordinary the casting process was uh, because Jane and I had been looking for a a kid who could play the Peter part that Cody plays. And it was only in the process of auditioning lots of young boys of that age that we realized just how tricky that part was going to be and that we needed someone who could have all those multi-layers but also stand up to Benedict. And Cody was the last person we saw. We saw him in Los Angeles and he came into the room and Jane immediately started talking to him as though he was Peter. And he was electrifying. We both knew at that point that he had out-Petered, Petered, and kind of wanted it to stop before he put a foot wrong because we'd found him and we wanted him and he was just breathtaking, so. Mm -hmm. um, Tanya, costumes, Kirsty Cameron, uh, what a terrific job. And one of the things that it, I know it is, is that the 
transformation of uh, Kirsten Dunst, for example, you it's delineated through the costume. It, 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 it shows the fragility as the, the movie progresses. Tell us about working with Kirsty Cameron. Yeah, I hadn't worked with neither Jane nor I had worked with Kirsty before, but it was a real pleasure to work with her. Jane, Kirsty, and Ari are all incredibly um, hardworking, dedicated women who never stop thinking about what they're doing. You know, they're really into detail and process. And Kirsty would come all the way. She she owned the palette of the film. And I think she gave that uh, the costumes a real sense of the kind of demise, emotional demise that um, Kirsten was going through. But also, she had a very um, acute sensitivity to all of the details, like the embroidery, um, the stitching, the sense of unraveling. It, it was all part of how she made up um, the, the feel of the film. Is she the one that came up with the satyr-like um, chaps? No, that, that was Jane. Uh, Jane, from the beginning, loved the sense of half man, half beast, and how she was going to play with that. With I, I remember I saw those in the, like, the first time I met Jane. Like, <laughs> it was like the first image she showed me, actually, was, was um, cowboys in, in those exact kind of chaps, yeah. Peter, you, you show us... Uh, part of Phil's inner psychology with the shots of the barn uh, windows looking to the main house and you insert mo those moments. Can you tell us about that? you and Jane arriving to those moments? Um, I'll just clear up that question. Do you mean like the shot out of the window with like the clouds going over the mountain? Those Correct. kind of shots? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, it's interesting that Jane's got such a feeling for like a place and landscape and the way she interprets it. She kind of feels it in a, in a way that I don't think I've ever seen anyone else quite describe before. She can really just get such a, understand a, a mountain or a landscape in a way that's um, really different. And there's just something about working with her that you start to see things in the same way <laughs> mm -hmm. after a little while. And yeah, a lot of that was we were very careful to never use landscape in a way as just beauty or it always had to be connected to, to a character or, or a story beat. Um, and Phil was often the one who, you know, we're kind of tracking his psychological um, space, especially when Rose enters the picture. And um, so, yeah, it was just about finding those places to use the beautiful hills around to to, to really point to his uh, psychological space. Cody Smith McPhee, welcome. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Welcome, Cody. Hello. Um, right before you came in, we were talking about uh, the big reveal at the end, and that, and that all along. If, when you watch the movie again, it's the hints are there about the personality. Can you tell us, from an actor point of view, calibrating the character? Um, um, wow, this is a beautiful. Venue, um, it's gorgeous. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, a lot of thought obviously goes behind that. Um, initially, I would say it's just fueled by the, ultimately the the passion um, and I guess the invitation into kind of uh, taking on such a challenge um, as Peter. For an actor, you know, he has so much that's internalized, and um, of course, it, it's it's easy to read into that because the picture's painted for you, but to convey that um, into live action, it's something else. So, I guess um, to to put it short and sweet, it, w it was really the kind of two to three weeks of rehearsals that I had with Jane, um, where we got to really kind of intimately go into all of these avenues of Peter and uh, just find how he ticks and um, 
just enjoy where he would kind of leave those hints, but also keeping him tastefully secretive. Mm -hmm. um, now that Cody's here, Peter, I'm, I was dying to ask you about the barn sequence and the editing. Things lurk in the darkness in that barn and the close-ups of, um, you know, the, with the, uh, you know, building the rope, et cetera. Can you tell it, was that a difficult editing process of that sequence? Uh, yeah, the, it wasn't, it's, it was difficult, but I mean, I guess that was one of the things that actually came up from the first part of the shoot to the second part of the shoot. Those close-ups were shot as a pickup day on the second part of the shoot. So Jane had seen it and kind of felt like there was a missing ingredient, which was the close-ups um, of the braiding. And that just gave us a really clear way to channel the energy in the room into an object. And um, I think Phil does that throughout on his own. It's the first time we see him kind of use that language with Cody in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, yeah, there's just an electricity that happens in that scene. And the performances were so incredible. So it was just about watching these, um, these looks to each other and just, just measuring and, and finding the pace. And mm -hmm. You were going to say something, Tanya? Well, no, I was just going to say that the rope in that scene is like one of the examples of how Jane takes something as simple as a rope, which is a defining um, metaphor for the whole film. And she shows you every stage of it being made, whether it's the calf skin being cut, um, uh, all the braiding, you, you, you see the whole process of cow, t yeah, the, exactly, <laughs> um, and it's all hidden like the clues um, in the film, so it gives you the opportunity when you see it a second time mm -hmm. to see the, the murder weapon <laughs> being put together <laughs> by the sly um, sweet boy. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, C Cody, what was it like for you to shoot that scene? Um, the barn scene specifically. The barn scene, yes. I think for everyone, um, it was very special. You could, well, first of all, from the exterior, just technically speaking, the barn itself, it was actually daytime. And so the barn was completely covered in this, in this um, draped black, you know, I don't know, what do you call that? Um, bas basically to block out the light. But it looked like an, like an amazing contemporary art piece in the middle of this vast landscape and then you kind of enter it, it feels like an initiation or something like that into this beautifully like moody, lit, quiet, kind of closed set. So, I mean, the environment um, and, and the kind of vibe of it was already amazing in that sense, but um, that was just to, you know, lay the foundation for, for us to be able to play and work in that very sensitive, um, sexy, but also scary, impending doom kind of sequence, yeah. I love, seeing you in person because the the peter that we know tonally is completely different from you and also phys physically um you have such a distinct mannerisms in the film can you talk about developing the tone and also the the physicality absolutely i mean uh, yeah so that was one of the most rewarding i think parts of the experience in working with Jane. Um, that's where I talk a lot about how she invited me into making braver choices, um, more daring choices. And she, because I could put my complete trust into her as a filmmaker and just as an amazing person and this, this force of nature, first of all, that was, that was a great relief because you know, I would have these initial thoughts as an actor when thinking about the certain elements of him, like his lisp or the way that he does carry himself or the way that his genes swoop on one, one another. <laughs> and I would worry, you know, because he is keeping a secret that I, I don't want to make these things too comical or too outgoing, you know. Um, and Jane I, was always pushing me, I guess, in that sense, because I'm, I'm one to really underplay stuff. I think it's safer to underplay it and have someone turn, turn me up, you know? Um, and so Jane had me go to some Alexander Technique expert, um, which was a technique that I had used in, in writing and more in grammar, 
um, in my character development, but never necessarily to the point of crawling on all fours and displaying the characteristics and embodying the characteristics of uh, a uh, what was it, a fox that I chose for for Peter, because you know they're they're so light on their feet, but they're also um, you know they can kill. Um, and the way that they hunt is really interesting too. They they do this cute kind of creep up, and then they see like a hole, and they do this really cute but dangerous pounce in the sky, and then dive right down. Um, so I, I saw a lot of these parallels, and I really enjoyed that that side of it. Um, and then yeah, there was there was also the kind of idea of returning to techniques that I guess in our naivete as actors or any, anyone in a craft, you think well that was something I did way back there, you know, you, you feel you kind of mastered it in a way, I, I don't want to say that, because I feel, now I know, and, and I always try and treat myself like this, that we're a student of the world and we're a student always of our craft. So, um, I basically just revisited uh, working with a dialect coach and that's where we dialed in the lisp um, and possibly like a higher higher voice to, to give off the vulnerability. And, then specifically work with a body coach specialist, which was where we dialed in every mode of his being, whether it's walking or running or standing still, just that contemplative, initially it almost looks like he's nervous, but on, on that recontextualized view of him by the end of it, and if you watch it again, you see he's just always ticking, he's always thinking, and he's actually very confident. and. Uh, I think something really important about him is that he doesn't necessarily change as a person. He doesn't really have an arc. I would say that the arc is rather the audience's perspective of him shifting from one side to the other. And uh, that's what tells his story. But he's always solidified in his being, and, and that's who he is, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Tanya, tell us about um, casting and working with Kristen Dunst and Jesse Plemons. Oh, well, you know, how lucky you are to have Kirsten Dunst and Jesse Plemons. They're such phenomenal actors, and it was a blessing, really, to have them. Um, they, uh, Jesse has that extraordinary quality of just being present, and Kirsten can turn emotion and break your heart with the bat of an eyelid. Uh, I, I found myself on set like having tears drop down my eyes occasionally with the little moves that Kirsten made. And one of my favorite scenes is the one on the top of the hill where Jesse confides how happy he is not to be alone. Mm -hmm. that, what, is, it, is it me, but she, lower, she makes her voice smaller as the movie progresses? I, I think she has an amazing capacity to diminish herself, to allow herself to begin to disappear. And between Kirsten and Jesse, they really, I mean, Kirsten and Jane, they really manage to make Rose's demise much more palpable than it was in Savage's book, actually. I think it was one of the great um, contributions that the two of them brought to the film. Um. Cody, you read the book, and, and, and what resonated in you about, about your character when you read the book? Um, I guess it was just uh, really nice to, you know, obviously I read the script first, and there's only so much that you can fit into, um, into the time that we have. So it was lovely to go through the book and kind of explore these other avenues. Um, there was a bunch of questions that don't necessarily need to be answered for the sake of a movie, but were answered for the sake of a book. Um, and I would, I would recommend everyone, you know, go read the book if you enjoyed the movie, because there's just so much, um, there's so much to explore there. But uh, in terms of Peter, I mean, there was just, I guess, it, it's just more material for me to grab. It's, I, I view it from more of a, a work, you know, point. I, it was just more for me to dive into and pull from, and to kind of fill in the gaps for what wasn't in there in the script, which is what I would do, you know, anyway, if there wasn't a book, if we weren't adapting. I would, I would soak the script of everything it's worth, and then I would go in and fill the gaps. So I have that subconscious of him that I can always pull from. So it was cool to have that um, there for me as a confirmation. Uh, but yeah, there's some, 
there's some really interesting, you know, kind of backstory to, to Peter and his father and, and things like that, um, that that gave me a lot to kind of work with and pull from. Um, and Peter, you allow the characters to dictate the, the narrative. You know, can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, I think for Jane, it was one of the things we talked really early on about, about this telling the story as elegantly um, as possible and, and that was all about letting the characters tell this story and not being forceful and letting performance dictate our pace and, and the structure of scenes. So we really tried not to cut away when something you know great was happening with these guys. Um, and when there was a lot being revealed, like there's a shot of Phil on the bed listening to Rose and George uh, and it's just such a beautiful, long close-up, um, you know, which is, you know, it's unusual, I guess, in a lot of films these days, you know, to, to hold for so long on, on a face and just let that be the landscape and, and just let the audience in behind, you know, the veil, especially in a character that's so outwardly um, poisonous to everyone around him. To, to see that vulnerability and get in behind it and have the time to really get underneath the skin yeah. was really important to the story kind of working and understanding where Phil's emotional space really was and how much pain there was there and how damaged he is. Mm -hmm. And Tanya is one of the most celebrated films of the year. Um, 12 nominations. How, how do you feel about the reception your film has received? Well, it's kind of extraordinary and um, very gratifying. We, we didn't set out to make a film to win awards. We, we set out to make a film that we would be proud of and that we hoped people would enjoy watching. And when you get this kind of a response, you sort of realize that it's landed and somehow the culture has acknowledged and welcomed it and for any filmmaker or producer that's all you can hope for and you know working with Jane was a dream come true for me as I think it probably was for my colleagues here so you know that that would have been reward enough but this is just extraordinary and Cody Academy Award nominee how does it feel Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, man, it's really hard to put into words. Um, but to give it a try, I mean, um, yeah. I've been at this for a long time. Since I, I was about eight years old, my, my dad asked me if I wanted to try acting. My dad's a former pro wrestler who caught the acting bug after doing a Burger King commercial. So that shows <laughs> our lineage, where we came from. He went on to have an amazing career, but to start, yeah, in Australia, it was just something I did for fun, and then it, it quickly escalated into a passion and something I could see myself doing for the rest of my life. And also, um, not only did it serve me in so many ways creatively, but it can influence others in such, such um, positive ways. I mean, that's a privilege to be a part of. And, and it's become so intertwined with my, my personal life and the setbacks that I've faced and having the support team behind me to to keep me moving forward. Um, so yeah, to say the least, it's, it's, all, it's all been worth it. Like it just, it's amazing to be redeeming that, that recognition. Um, and, and not only that, not just for myself, but to see the rest of you know, my, my family, away from my family up there on the screen with me, Jesse, Kirsten, uh, Ari, um, of course, Jane, it's, yeah, it's magnificent. And Peter, how did it feel to hear your name? A uh, pretty surreal <laughs> moment. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, like Tanya said, like, you know, making the film was the, all I thought about up until the film was done, and really, like, this kind of part of it didn't really enter my thinking at all. Um, but, yeah, it's kind of very... Uh, it's a real honour to <laughs> be, you know, recognised uh, for your contribution and, yeah, and for the film to have made such an impact on culture and... It's kind of all you ever hope making something that it's going to have an impact. So 
Um, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, it's a terrific film, and, and thank you, the three of you, for being here today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.